Hello, and welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. I'm with Alexi Baker of Oxford University. Alexi is an expert on the 18th century trade and scientific instruments in London, and she's going to be talking about the instruments, their makers, and their role in the experimental lectures which flourished in the 18th century. Making scientific instruments in 18th century London. In this, the second part of her talk on experimental lecturing in the 18th century, Alexi discusses the different types of instruments being manufactured and the people to whom they were sold. 18th century London was a complex warren of neighbourhoods with different characteristics and appearances. The early modern capital was still smaller than it is today and was easily crisscrossed by foot, wheel and water rather than by catching the tube. The production and sale of scientific instruments took place in all corners of the city to different degrees and instrument makers and sellers were central to many communities and skilled craft networks. The use of instruments was woven throughout almost all aspects of this bustling world as well. But what were these scientific instruments that I keep mentioning? During the 1700s, they included some items which you might not expect. The modern usage of the word science was not established until the later 1800s. Actors of the Enlightenment, such as the Fellows and Correspondents of the Royal Society, instead discussed natural philosophy as well as a wide variety of subjects which we would not consider very scientific. 18th century instruments were not labeled as scientific then, but usually as optical, mathematical, or philosophical. Most mathematical instruments, for example drawing tools and quadrants and octants, had a graduated scale for performing calculations or for measuring angles or distance. Optical instruments involved glass or metal lenses and mirrors and included the sights on many navigation and surveying instruments. Common examples of this class are microscopes, telescopes, and eyeglasses. Philosophical instruments were for the demonstration or investigation of natural phenomena, such as magnetism, electricity, and the attributes of air. These were often used in public demonstrations, since they could be so exciting. Electrical machines could spark, sizzle, and even explode and small birds and mammals were sometimes suffocated inside of air pumps to show the effects of a lack of air. Producers and retailers in London supplied these instruments to countless individual and institutional customers, both at home and abroad. These included, among others, educators and lecturers, affluent virtuosi and collectors, early researchers and observatories, the navy and the military, trading companies, architects, navigators, and surveyors basically a large number of people from many different walks of life. Instruments were designed and produced for almost all socioeconomic levels as well. They could be bought ready-made, which would be cheaper, or could be commissioned. And they were sometimes made of paper or wood instead of metal to lower costs. Basic eyeglasses were even hawked in the street. In part because of this great diversity of sources of demand, instrument makers increasingly sold a wide variety of stock, as you can see in this trade card or illustrated advertisement. It was used by Nathaniel Hill around mid-century, and likely before that by John Coggs. Since this was before widespread industrialization, no one craftsman could ever hope to make so many different instruments by him or herself. This is why 18th century instrument makers and sellers depended heavily upon bartering and subcontracting, or the hiring out of work, to obtain partial and whole ready-made instruments for their shops. This meant that large-scale workshops were usually not necessary. The most common scenario was still for a master instrument maker to run a combination shop and home with the assistance of a succession of apprentices, relatives, and perhaps a small number of journeymen and employees. Larger shops really only began to appear more frequently towards the end of the century. Most of the 18th century represents the pinnacle of success for this highly diverse trade in its traditional crafts-based form. It had first arrived in England from the Low Countries about two centuries earlier. By the 1700s, the trade in London was more extensive than that anywhere else in the world, and the instrument makers of the English capital were the most respected in Europe, alongside a small number of French colleagues. There's also tons of evidence for the trade having been a profitable one for most of its members, 
including in wills, insurance policies, and contemporary accounts. Quite a few instrument businesses were so successful that they flourished in one location for decades, or in a small number of cases for more than a century. There are hundreds of instrument makers and sellers who are known to have run their own businesses in the city during the 1700s, and it's clear that hundreds more may have existed. When one takes into account the many apprentices, journeymen, employees, and subcontractors who attended them, the estimate of people involved in the trade at some point during their lives rises to at least the low thousands. What all this means is that the instrument trade and its products were pervasive in 18th century London, and indeed in Britain at large for many socioeconomic classes. And the nature of that trade was far different than that envisioned by earlier and more idealistic historians. As a whole, it was not driven and molded by purely scientific forces, but by commercial concerns, and by the sorts of social and geographic considerations specific to individual families and communities. It shared many skills, materials, markets, and locations with other early crafts, such as printing, metalwork, clockmaking, and the fashion trades. This led to many relationships between members of the different trades, and to some instrument makers pursuing multiple crafts. Thus, the bywords in instrument making at this time were flexibility and diversification. As you can see in this trade card, even the Dollins, the famous opticians whose business later became Dolland and Acheson, offered a variety of types of instruments at their shop. Peter's father, John, had disproved Newton's belief that the chromatic aberration in glass lenses could not be corrected. He patented an achromatic lens in 1758, which greatly improved refracting telescopes. Few trade members found success at this time in only serving the more intellectually inclined customers. If instrument makers and sellers did serve these luminaries and research bodies such as observatories, then they usually served professional or genteel customers as well. The majority of trade members bypassed dedicated intellectuals almost entirely and targeted their wares at people of fashion or at those involved in professions such as accounting and surveying or in commercial interests like shipping. Very few members of the trade could find success in specialization during this period either, as did the Scottish immigrant James Short. Short was unique in only making the metal mirrors for reflecting telescopes, and in being worth more than 20,000 pounds when he died in 1768. That would likely make him a millionaire today. It was instead extremely common for retailers to offer many types of instruments, and often instruments alongside other goods, running the gamut from books and broadsheets to ship chandler's wares, to jewelry and the fashionable trinkets known as toys. Newspaper advertisements show that many instrument makers and sellers also sold the sorts of small common stock you could find across London at this time, including medicinal elixirs, beauty concoctions, commemorative medals, lottery tickets, and playing cards. Sometimes lecturing on natural philosophy and other subjects was added to this mix when it might prove profitable. This enhanced podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist was Lucy Cook. It was edited by Lucy Cook and Pete Langman. The producer was Pete Langman. Mm-hmm.